I think we're on. I think we're live there, Phil. I think we're live. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, we are just going to give people a couple of couple of seconds to log on as people as people get onto the um, the webcast. Dave, we were just talking about Zoom, and we're using Zoom for everything now. I we've been doing this thing with our uh, family in uh, here in Melbourne, where a lot of the restaurants are doing delivery. We'll order a whole bunch of delivery to like four different places, so the family can eat together. And then we'll just set up their laptops at the uh, dinner table and, and we'll, uh, we'll Zoom these folks around the well, dinner the, party. The next level you have to do is you all have to order the same thing. So you got to all order <laughs> lasagna. And so the whole family's having family yeah. lasagna just in other regions. No, that's kind of what we do. We, we, we pick one of the restaurants that does a takeout and we'll order family style for each, each place. And yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's awesome. Actually, it's one of those really interesting repurposes that I've seen with, you know, business models. We've got florists here that are delivering fresh vegetables instead yeah. of flowers. And actually it's a great time to send flowers because you don't get to go and see people and give them a hug. So well, and you you know, if you can, support, if you can do that. Businesses right now, which I think is yeah. important and whatnot. Yeah, it's become essential. So yeah. it's 3.30 here in uh, San Francisco, 6.30 p.m. in New York and 8.30 a.m. here in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome to the Supply Chain Bunker. Uh, each week in the bunker, we see different experts from manufacturing and supply chain come together to share experience, ideas, and insights. And as we struggle through the challenges presented by disruption to supply, demand, and workplace practices because of COVID-19, we all need a little help and advice from time to time. Yes, sir. Today, we do. Today's Today's two guests are two of my favorite people and people that I, whose content I follow regularly. I really wanted to get some people on that are kind of right in the middle of this debate and talking to a lot of people. So we're bringing together two guests that have not just spent years in manufacturing and supply chain, but who, who are regularly published. Um, Sarah Barnes Humphrey is the founder and host of the podcast and blog series, Let's Talk Supply Chain, a, a, a podcast that's only two years old, but already hitting 10,000 downloads each month. Uh, Sarah has spent around 20 years in logistics and supply chain and is also co-founder of Ships, uh, which is a new technology platform for the supply chain industry. And we'll explore that a little bit later. Um, Ron Keith, I think uh, some of you all know Ron Keith. He's a pretty well-known supply chain expert and one of my go-to guys for all things manufacturing and supply chain. Yeah. Again, decades of experience in the supply chain industry and a reputation of being pretty much a straight shooter and a strategic thinker, which is uh, hugely valuable. Ron founded Riverwood Solutions, which has recently been renamed Supply Chain Resource Group. They help companies with their supply chain and manufacturing overseas. Um, in this week's bunker, we're gonna explore some of the big picture issues, what's happening now, what's gonna be happening through the recovery, uh, and what's going to be happening in the future. And it's a, it's a unique opportunity to explore topics and to get interactive and get, um, get involved in the debate. So ask, ask these guys anything. Get some, um, get some tough questions out there and get them thinking. I'd really like to see some people put in some questions in the, uh, in the chat window or the Q&A tab, wherever, wherever you're uh, most comfortable. I just want to hit a few headlines before we um, get into the conversation because, you know, every week, every week there's a lot happening, but I think this week we've seen some interesting movement as we go through this crisis. And we're seeing more and more discussions about the supply chain post COVID-19 and the recovery and the longer term and words like agility and resilience are coming up again and again. We'll get into that a bit more with our guests. One of the topics that has come up is where stuff's manufactured and where that supply chain dependency exists. And Japan have announced a multi-billion dollar stimulus package to shift manufacturing dependence out of China. So basically the government are paying Japanese companies to manufacture almost anywhere else. Um, meanwhile, we're seeing some momentum in the US on similar ideas with stuff going through Congress. Um, but also a desire to bring back manufacturing. And to me, what's clear there is people aren't going to necessarily want to pay for that. So how do we deal with that challenge and how do we deal with that capacity match and how do we deal with trying to get the same value and efficiency? And I see a big momentum there for automation and digital transformation. Yeah. Manufacturers, 
are stepping up and collaborating, which I think is awesome. I think for the first time in a long time, I saw a press release headline from Phillips that had Flex and J-Bill mentioned in the same sentence. You were um, the same? Exactly, yep. Flex and J-Bill both helping to, um, to repurpose um, assembly lines and supply chains for to ramp up the production of Philips ventilators. So that was great to see. And I just, you know, you'd love to be a fly on a wall in some of those supply chain meetings with the Flex guys and the, uh, and the J-Bill guys. But, you know, despite, despite pockets of increased demand, the national federal data shows manufacturing output fell to a 74 year low. Um, motor vehicle output plummeted 28% and consumer demand a similar amount as automakers close their factories to prevent the spread of the contagion. So, you know, there's 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 a real disruption to demand, which I think is is being felt even more perhaps than the um, than the supply chain um, side of the issue now. But I think it is that triple triple whammy of uh, um, supply demand. And now the, um, the the workplace issues that's really challenging people. Have you been hearing from people? Dave, can you hear me? Yep, you're you're back online now. You cut okay. out. Okay. Yeah. So, what have you been hearing this week, Dave? What's been going on in your world? Yeah, for sure. I've been spending a lot of time talking with. Uh, with different customers on on inventory, actually, believe it or not, that that's been the hot topic for me as what we're seeing that when this hit, folks still had a lot of buffer stock or inventory and now mm -hmm. actually shifting to where a lot of those are depleted. And so this kind of took me on a rabbit hole, I would say of conversations. And I think we have some great guests to talk about some of this. Um, and I'll actually post a, an article here that came out just this month uh, to everyone. And this is from uh, the Harvard Business Review. So obviously the HBS, Harvard uh, Business School, um, and from a professor there that I love, uh, Willie Sheesh. And it really talks around this uh, fundamental idea that I wanted to share back with everyone that came from Tim Cook uh, a while back where it's inventory is the fundamental evil. And this has been the way that a lot of different companies have been building their and leveraging their supply chains for a while, where you want to reduce all costs uh, by any means necessary by squeezing out inventory, because that's where you have costs that just in the middle of your supply chain. And so I, I've been having this conversation with lots of other leaders uh, and different operators from large companies that are, you know, Fortune 500, all the way down to, to smaller businesses as well. And so I thought I'd share a couple points from here that I thought was interesting. Um, there's this idea that comes from kind of the Apple way of running supply chain where you have a, and Toyota did this too post-World War II of a Toyota city model. So it's where suppliers mm -hmm. are tightly clustered together geographically, um, where, you know, they're all interreliant. So you can think of Detroit is a really great example of it, or yeah. Shenzhen, Pearl River Delta area that you have this tight geographic. And a lot of ways what we've seen is that we went from that model to being supply chains that span the globe, where the dependencies is on the logistics and, and having uh, predictability here. And this is all to reduce cost. And so um, what happens is that if you're relying on on-time delivery of this global supply chain network, as inventory gets low, you start having all of these delays that happen. And we see this say in ventilators today, and so, yes, you can repurpose and have GM or Ford make ventilators, but what happens when you don't have this Toyota city model where everything's made in a small geographic area, you actually have reliance on a global level. Um, and this is all driven by cost being the driver. And so kind of this, you know, Tim Cook inventory is fundamentally evil. So it just made me think a lot. And as I had these conversations with different leaders around how is cost being the driver going to change in a post-COVID era? Will we see yeah. people, you know, uh, actually want to pay more for things because of reliability or better, uh, uh, you know, having safety inventories? Um, yeah. so there was three kind of takeaways I, I thought I'd share that I kind of distilled my conversations down. Um, and so I thought I'd share these lessons. The first is to plan for uh, diversifying sources 
from critical mm -hmm. components. So as I talked to different operators that I saw more companies planning for diversification on critical components than maybe yeah. they've had in the, the past. Um, the second one is where you can't diversify, actually create buffer stock. So that was pretty yeah. surprising. I saw more yeah. companies thinking about carrying more inventory right now or purchasing basically safety stock to sit on, which is a completely different supply chain strategy yeah. than what we've seen in the past. Um, and then the last one was on examining bottlenecks and building plans. That as I talked to operation leaders, they were sharing that they've never spent more time on bottleneck uh, uh, and then planning against these. And um, so I just thought I'd share that with the bunker. Yeah. That if people aren't thinking about this, you, you should be essentially. You absolutely need to be. And I think it's fascinating you talk about that uh, inventory thing. And I think a lot of people will be having the um, conversation where they say, hey, didn't we say inventory is the enemy? It would be great if we had some right now. Um, and, you know, you look at the whole lean principles with just in time, with lean, yeah. you know, rapid turnover of inventory, all those kind of things. They do, they are challenged by the disruption that we're having now. I think one of the issues when I look back at different crises in the past and going back as far as the kind of tech wreck at the turn of the millennium, mm -hmm. um, one of the issues we had there was massive inventory overhang and that's where inventory suddenly became the enemy. That was badly managed inventory. Well-managed inventory, I think, is a different thing. Well, I, um, I went down this entire rabbit hole because you know I'm a history mm -hmm. nerd, right? So I said Toyota brought on this principle post-World War II. And so why did Toyota go to this Toyota city model and really the, the, the historians, the way they describe it is this idea that Toyota at the time was so small compared to the yeah. massive uh, US OEMs, the, the GMs, uh, Chryslers, Fords of the world. And so they felt that the only way that they could compete with those large OEMs because of their purchasing power was to have no inventory, that they had yeah. less cash, so no inventory, and that they would do on demand versus the Ford, they would just have stockpiles of inventory, yeah. always have throughput, the, you know, the assembly line never down. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, but I think history has a way of repeating itself or yeah. looking back. And so, hey, is this idea of just in time on now not a, a tight geographic, but really it's a, a global connectedness. Yeah. What happens when the world shuts down like yeah. a pandemic? What, what yeah. do supply chains do? Uh, yeah. You know, I think there's some really great principles to study there for sure. Yeah, and I think there will be lots of study and discussion on that. And you talk about that Toyota Village idea. Mm -hmm. um, when we get Ron on a little bit later, I'm going to mention Flex Guadalajara because when they moved into Guadalajara in 99, they literally built a mall with units and they invited their, their suppliers and their manufacturers. Hey, just come take some space because we can't make this work without sheet metal, without injection molding, without all those vendors companies grew in their little mall and then they moved out to their own facilities, but they created this supply chain in a region that wasn't there. And now Guadalajara has become, you know, the capital of, of EMS probably in the Americas, let alone in Mexico. So super impressive supply chain built from it. Yeah, infrastructure is so key, right? Shenzhen is the perfect example, that Pearl River Delta region, yep. fishing village and that. Yeah. The center Foxconn tried to do that with Wisconsin and they yeah. wanted to build it and there's a lot of things to be able to compete there but uh yeah anyways I think yeah. it's good chance to bring in our our guests and uh, yeah yeah let's things. let's let's bring um just before we bring Sarah in I just wanted to get a quick update from you on on face shields that project's been been going for a week or so I know you had a lot of inquiries are we shipping now what's going on 100% shipping all, all over we have tools that are running both in Asia uh, as well as across the United States and, and shipping uh, to different countries right now, too. So it's just been phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To and uh, we're getting some early pictures in of, of frontline workers wearing wearing our masks, which is uh, oh, that's fantastic. Well, super. Can imagine. Yeah, super proud of how, how the team came together and made that happen so fast. Great job. So let's bring Sarah Barnes Humphrey in now, and we can have a chat about what's happening in the logistics world. Sarah, what I wanted to touch on first is I know you've been talking to some uh, some different people in different in different sectors, but I know you've been getting a bit of a, a kind of a big economist picture on what's going on, what's going on in the world and supply chain in the last day or so. So, anything anecdotal you can let us, any tidbits you can let us have? 
Sure, yeah. Hi, everybody. I am really happy to be here. Thank you guys for having me on. Actually, um, Sarah, just give us a quick intro before you, uh, before you answer that oh, question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's do that. So I have been in logistics and supply chain for over two decades. 20 years just sounds way too long. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and uh, I started a podcast about uh, three years ago. I rebranded it about two years ago. Today is our two-year anniversary for <laughs> Let's Talk Supply Chain. And I am spending it with you guys and really, Stop really excited. Chain. So um, so it's a really big day for us. Um, it's a podcast. We've got a woman in supply chain series. We interview all sorts of companies across supply chain. We've uh, turned it into a YouTube channel and a blog series. And uh, I'm also CEO of Ships, which is a new supply chain platform that I am working on currently. We've just soft launched the beta and going into a pilot program. So uh, very, very excited about that. So that's a little bit. Yeah, that's a little bit about me. And yeah, I was I was able to get, you know, a big picture view from a couple of people today. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned it because it's, you know, I've written a whole bunch of notes. I won't <laughs> go through it all, I promise. No. Um, but maybe I'll give you a bit of the, the conclusion. They were talking about globalization. They were talking about how globalization, a lot of people are talking about it being at risk. Um, but they don't really see that happening. They see that globalization is going to balance out. Um, we're still going to have demand overseas. They might be near, some of the larger companies might nearshore certain products to be able to uh, meet the demand locally. Mm -hmm. um, and so you might see production being shifted. So, you know, maybe a car manufacturer uh, shifting some manufacturing to the U.S. to uh, meet the demand in the U.S. market, but also keeping manufacturing in China to meet the demand in China rather yeah. than um, doing both markets from one or two locations overseas. Mm -hmm. um, but in conclusion, they were basically saying that the recovery is going to be aggressive. Um, obviously, we're going to see an uptick in the last half of this year. Yeah. And by the end of next year, we're actually going to be at the same numbers uh, GDP wise that we were at the end of 2019. Uh, yeah, 2019. Um, which is hopeful. I mean, you know, mm. sitting in where we are right now, it's, you know, it was great to really hear about what that forecast kind of looks like, you know, especially yeah. with everything we're hearing in the news and, and what's going on and, and how much is really changing for us. Um, they were also saying that, you know, virt more virtual activity, which we're already kind of seeing right now, yeah. um, price efficiencies, but they're saying that trade and investment will resume quite quickly. So, um, I think a lot of people are mentioning, I know Dave, you said this earlier, that it might be a W, it might be a V. Some yeah. of the charts that I was seeing today was that it's going to be a fairly deep V. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a great conversation for all business owners, operators, supply chain folks of how does that economy look? Is it go down and up? Is it more U-shaped and takes a while? But I, I think it's great to, to have the, the real-time view that you're really hopeful, I think, in a lot of ways, what it sounds like that, that we will bounce back. And it's probably it's probably not as bad as, as uh, it looks right now. Yeah, I think what's interesting there as well, Dave, is there's there's going to be a different shape in different in different areas. So even if there's an overall V, it might look like a W for someone else. It might look like a different shape for someone else. And Sarah, one of the areas I was interested in is when you think about freight and shipping and airlines, you know, airlines, particularly the passenger airlines are having a torrid time. We're um, figuring out in Australia whether we can manage with one flag carrier or one airline rather than two because our second airline is, is basically asking for a bailout. Mm -hmm. um, how's that looking in terms of the freight side? Is that picking up some of the slack from passengers? How are, how are, how's the freight industry coping? Well, I know when it comes to PPE, um, a lot of the passenger airlines I've seen, I think we've all seen the pictures where they've taken out the passenger seats to accommodate for capacity on the cargo side. Mm. Um, there's still freight moving. So, and it really all depends on what, what industry, right? So if you think about clothing and footwear, Mm -hmm. They already put in their orders. And so there's an excess of product, spring inventory that's being shipped over or already has been shipped over and landed oh. with 
not a lot of space to put it <laughs> um, because you're not selling as much. You don't have your bricks and mortar stores. Your distribution is kind of halted to, to a certain extent. And so there's a lot of cargo being kept in ocean containers, to be honest, which is a very, very costly way of keeping inventory that's not going to move. So it'll be interesting to see how they are going to move that through to consumers mm -hmm. once sort of shopping is back online. Um, but right now they are dealing with a lot of excess inventory. Um, as far as air freight, as far as electronics is concerned, electronics are still moving. I mean, with everybody moving to working remotely, you know, there's been an uptick in obviously the sale on computers and different things like that. So there's a lot of electronics that are moving by air freight as well. So I think there has been somewhat of a downturn, obviously, um, but there is still product, there's, there is still cargo moving. And, um, but as far as, you know, passenger and travel, it's going to take a couple of months for them to get those airplanes back into rotation and really starting to uh, bring travel back to the everyday person. Yeah. And how are you thinking about, you know, with the different, uh, all the different folks that you talk to and experts, you know, are they, are they looking to change their strategies at all, you know, from a, a logistics and freight perspective? Like what, what are you hearing or what advice would you, you share there? There's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, I think a lot of companies are looking to shift. I think right now a lot of the focus is really on supply chain tech, right? Like what have we shelved previously and where are our gaps, right? Because this is shining a huge light on the gaps that we have in supply chain, where we can make things more efficient, where we can improve processes. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of the tech that's been shelved previously is now being taken a look at um, in the light and saying, you know, where can we implement this? How can we implement this? Um, so I think as far as supply chain tech is concerned, that's really something that's taking yeah the main stage at the moment. As far as supply chain and logistics, I think, like you said earlier, diversification of manufacturing is going to happen. I mean, depending on the product, I've even spoken about, you know, taking a look at capital intensive inventory being in your warehouses versus yeah. raw materials and how far are we along maybe with even 3D printers. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so that's going to sort of change the way we keep inventory in our warehouses, um, taking a look at those types of strategies rather than always having finished products being on the water or in the air. So there's a lot of discussion happening. I almost think that, you know, it's a really great time to be in supply chain right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of supply, like you say, there's a lot of disruption and there's a lot of change there and a lot of challenges and a lot of rethinking. And I think probably a lot of those companies that are now looking at those solutions urgently were looking at those solutions before, but there was no burning building. There was no, right. we need to get this done in Q1 because something's going to happen in Q2. The bottom line is some things have happened in the past, something's happened now, things are going to happen again in the future. So, you know, get ready for disruption because disruption, you know, changes, changes reality. And that's, you know, that's kind of the situation where we're in at the moment. And I think maybe one of the dividends that we'll see is that, is that digital transformation moving a little bit faster because that's going to help us with all those um, inventory issues that you talked about as well, Dave. Having visibility on that is the only way to... Um, to truly be able to manage that and also managing the agility of multiple locations. Yeah, and let's talk about that. That uh, I think that trend that, that you're seeing, Sarah, like I, I agree with you in the disruption in supply chain and it never could be better. And, and obviously we're a tech company in, in the supply chain space too. But where, where do you think those opportunities are? I know you're just getting something off the ground. So I'd love to hear maybe a bit about that. But what are other areas that you think we can apply technology to drive better efficiencies in supply chain. What, what, are, what are those gaps you see? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, a lot of, traditionally we've been very document driven, <laughs> right? Um, we've been very manual on the logistics side. And so I think there's a ton of opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really 
paring down some of the manual activity that that people do involve themselves in on a day-to-day -day basis when it comes to supply chain documentation management i've been talking to i actually did a panel um a couple of weeks ago you know based on rpa and scraping documents and different things like that i think there's a huge huge opportunity there mm -hmm. um i also think that there's a really big opportunity to bring in some tech um that is low cost um for a lot of the freight forwarding companies so accessible right? what you think is like not large software it takes forever and they're tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars just SaaS really plays. accessible software yeah 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 SaaS plays um yeah. i think that those are going to be hugely important especially you know the the freight forwarding community as they come out of this mm -hmm. um because they were already tasked prior to this with you know mark uh, you know, uh, issues and challenges with marketing and technology and sales. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that's kind of where my platform's coming in. So I might be a little bit biased, <laughs> um, but I, I do think that, you know, SaaS plays are, are really going to be hugely, hugely important. I mean, gone are the days that we're going to sit there and make our own uh, software. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think, I think, you know, it's just not doable anymore, you know, with the investment, the time we have to be pivoting quickly. There's so much uncertainty now. We don't know what next month is going to look like, what the month after that's going to look like, including, you know, even consumer behavior, yeah. right? So when it comes to retailers and taking a look at their supply chain, I think, you know, we almost need to, to wait and kind of see what that be, uh, consumer behavior is going to be because yeah. you've got yeah. a really big um, shift right now. You know, people are being furloughed. They're being laid off They're you know, but there's also other people that are employed and have nowhere to go and nowhere to spend their money. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's really going to be interesting. Are they going to change their behaviors? And if they are going to change their behaviors, what does that mean? And yeah. how is the supply chain going to support that? Yeah, and there's going to be another layer on top of that, Sarah, in terms of um, uh, sentiment. You know, are people going to be looking to buy products that are made in made in America, made locally? Is that going to impact on uh, on what consumers buy and, and where that stuff has to be sourced that's from? Right. And and are they going to be prepared to pay more for it? And on that, I think that's a really great point to bring our second guest, Ron Keith, in. Ron's the founder of. Uh, Riverwood Solutions, which recently was rebranded the Supply Chain Resource Group. Ron, are you are you there? I am. How are you doing, Phil? Okay, I'm doing good. Can you unmute your video? I can't see you right now. Unmute your video. That's a good one. I, I like. Is that a thing? <laughs> there you go. I think it's unmute your video. Sound I can see you. Would be good. You're looking. You're looking good. Um, yeah. So, Ron, a couple of things. Quick introduction, I wanted to touch base with you on Flex Guadalajara because I think it talks very much to um, what Dave was talking about in terms of building these manufacturing towns and what that might look like in the future, but also what you think about that sentiment of the consumer and shifting manufacturing to less Chinese locations. Yeah, so there's a couple of topics there. So in terms of Flex Guadalajara, you know, they're not the only ones to do that. And, and even Toyota that, you know, that Dave was mentioning, you know, Henry Ford, you know, River Rouge, the, the, the factory complex that, that he created that was incredibly vertically integrated, you know, will forever remain the largest manufacturing operation in the history of the world. Yeah. And, and so Flex was taking, you know, a play out of that playbook. But a lot of people have done that. You know, Foxconn, when Foxconn has gone into other places, when they first went into Chengdu, Chengdu really didn't have the electronics infrastructure. And so, you know, they went to their top 40 suppliers and said, we want you all to come. Oh, and that's kind, of what Flex, that's kind of what Flex did, you know, in Guadalajara. Guadalajara, you know, they certainly had uh, a good pool of labor, um, you know, good inbound logistics, things like that, but just didn't have the infrastructure. And, you know, I think Guadalajara built in a seven or eight year period what it took the Pearl River Delta to build over a 20 year period. Yeah. So I think that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. And, and Ron, yeah. do you maybe want to just tell us a, a little bit about the Supply Chain Resource Group, you know, formerly Riverwood, and just uh, about yourself so everyone watching knows a bit more? Sure. So, um, you know, I'm a career manufacturing and supply chain person. I 
you know, grew up when uh, people would build their own products. I've run operations and manufacturing and engineering in captive factories. And uh, I went into the contract manufacturing business fairly early, ran some fairly large operations for Flextronics. When I started at Flextronics, we were doing about, you know, $200 million a year. And uh, when I left, we were doing about $18 billion a year. Um, I started uh, Supply Chain Resource Group, what is now called Supply Chain Resource Group in 2008. Uh, really bad timing for starting pretty much anything. <laughs> it was to help people take advantage of the newly globalizing or advanced globalizing world and the advanced outsourcing. Mm -hmm. And it was our observation that a lot of the really big companies, you know, the Cisco's of the world, the Dell's of the world, the Apple's of the world can really do that very well. You know, they have a global footprint. They can figure out where the resources and factories are for small to mid-sized companies. It's daunting and the world's a very big place. And although it's getting flatter, you know, it's still hard to figure out. So, you know, we provide resources around the world to help, companies figure out and also manage on an ongoing basis, you know, their, their supply chain, mostly in technology, but not exclusively. Cool. And with respect to, you know, you, you talk about the world, the world changing, what are you seeing in the, in the immediate term, in the urgent term, in, in terms of people shifting their manufacturing? Um, because initially it was, how do we get our manufacturing dependency out of China? Because that's where the first disruption is. But now we have China back pretty much back on run close to capacity and problems elsewhere, you know, like in, in, in Europe and in the U S what have, how have people managed that struggle? You know, people have done different things. Um, some companies, you know, on the heels of the tariffs have really been thinking about diversifying manufacturing. And as we've talked before, Phil, it's, it's always going to be a little bit more expensive to, to take your manufacturing and divide it into, you know, two or three batches in two or three locations, right? The question is how much of a hit is that, you know, will the customers, you know, pick that up and, and, and what is the benefit of doing that long-term? You know, do you want to have a 2% hit to your cost of goods sold in perpetuity because you're avoiding a once in a while, hundred percent hit. And so that's been the math. You know, if you look at what happened in Japan and I was glad that you brought that up, you know, Japan has now made a move, you know, I'm calling it, moving from a just-in-time environment in their supply chain to a just-in-case environment in their supply chain, right? Because, you know, there are some things that, you know, if you can't get them for a little bit of time, it's kind of an inconvenient. And then there are some things that, you know, are national security issues, their health issues, their pandemic issues. And so more and more people are starting to look at more and more countries and, and more and more large companies are looking at, I now have to do this. Yeah. It's not about weighing the economics of, of regionalization or the economics of diversification. It is now a mandate. It is coming from my board. It is coming from my shareholders. And so th th this is going to be an event that supply chain professionals are going to look back on and say, that was the event. It wasn't Fukushima, it wasn't the Thailand floods, but well, it was COVID. It wasn't tariffs. Yeah, it's, it's, this was the forcing function. And maybe there's a good question for both Sarah and, and for you, Ron, that I think on that idea, do you think that, do you really think people will start paying a premium in terms of costs that if you're going to do this, if you're going to create buffer stock, or if it's not an inconvenience, it's a mandatory now, you see Japan doing some of it of bringing it in house, but maybe Sarah, for you to start, like, do you think all supply chain professionals will stop looking at costs of that, that bottom line and that that'll start to shift or what's your, what's your view? No, I really don't think so. And again, that kind of goes back to the point where I said, you know, we got to sort of see where consumer behavior is going to be at the end of this and what people are spending their money on, mm -hmm. um, which will most likely dictate. But I don't think that that behavior is going to change. One thing I did want to ask any of you, and maybe Ron's the right person, what do you think about uh, Africa? Because I know that Africa has been a co continent that I've been hearing about over the last couple of years. I know the infrastructure isn't necessarily there yet, but there's companies that have already gone into Africa at least 18 months ago, um, like a PVH, right? Building manufacturing facilities there. Uh, we're talking a lot about Vietnam and Japan, but I just wanted to sort of throw Africa out there and see what you guys were mm. thinking about that one. What do you think, Ron? Yeah, so North Africa for the last, you know, 10 years has had a fairly robust contract manufacturing environment, right? There's, you know, there's semiconductor processing, there's electronics manufacturing, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, 
almost exclusively run by the Europeans. And there's some pretty good capacity there and some pretty good capability. Very low cost, very good logistics into uh, uh, into Western Europe. You know, you hop on a ferry, you cross the Med, and your product is there, and yet you're getting you know, China-like uh, labor inputs. You know, Sub-Saharan Africa is a lot more challenged. Sub-Saharan Africa is a very big place, and uh, it's also very broad. So, you know, on the coast where they have um, some population centers and where they have some relatively good inbound, you know, ocean logistics and stuff, I think you'll see more and more there. But, you know, that's a, a 25 or 30-year play. Um, they just don't have the infrastructure and they don't have the knowledge base. They don't have the experience base. And there are a lot of other problems. There are some, you know, geopolitical challenges in a lot of those countries as well. Mm -hmm. It's relatively small capacity down there, right, Ron? Relatively modest, capacity. relatively modest capacity down there? In the sub-Saharan part of Africa? In, yeah, well, in North Africa even. I mean, it's not, it's not huge numbers, is it? I look at the, you know, the French companies that have got facilities there, and it's, it's, it's not huge numbers. Yeah, it's, it's mostly the French and Germans. There's a couple of Belgian companies there. It, it's uh, certainly not huge, but, you know, it's, it's on par with, you know, you know, maybe what the capacity is that remains in Silicon Valley, for example. So it's not insignificant. No. You know, when you talk about replacing China, what is? I mean, what yeah. really is significant on a China type of scale, right? Maybe India, you know, 15 years from now. Yeah, yeah and it's 15 years from now. Just going back to Dave's question, do you think people, consumers are prepared to pay to have stuff manufactured? Do you think there's a premium on not manufactured in China? Nope. I saw, you, I saw you both shake your head simultaneously as he was asking, and I kind of didn't shake mine because I thought, I thought it was more of a poker <laughs> style <laughs> approach. You know, for, but, uh, for, for more than 70 years now, you had to put the little tag in the back of the shirt, you know, where it's made. Uh, and you know, that's a legacy of, of World War II and, you know, the reconstruction thereafter. And... I think it was proved pretty quickly that, you know, customers will buy on price for equivalent quality yeah. and they will buy based on brand. And so it's going to be interesting to see where the, where the money gets extracted. It's going to be somewhere in the supply chain, but it's not going to be in that last mile. Consumer behavior is not going to change, right? They like what they like and they don't care where your iPhone is built. They don't care whether it's built in Zhuhai or in, Chennai, they, they just don't care, right? It's an iPhone and that means everything that they need to know. But yeah. I think the uh, the OEMs and the brand owning enterprises, they're going to eat some of that cost. Now, if everybody's eating some of that cost, then maybe, you know, the overall market for some of these products, you know, squeaks up two or 3% so that everybody's on par. Well, let's talk about yeah. that, Ron, because I think it's a really interesting idea that you're saying consumers aren't going to change, but the cost has to come from somewhere. Maybe it's in the last mile is what you said, like where supply chains are already lean operations, you know, it's penny pitching across the board. So where, where do you think that if we move to a place where we need more buffer safety stock, or if it needs to be made in region so that, you know, you're not running these, where, where, where's that going to happen? What are your predictions of where that cost is going to come from then? So I think it's going to come partly out of the manufacturers. I think it's going to come partly out of the brand owning enterprises margin structure. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's really the biggest piece is the brand owners, you know, contract manufacturing, you know, low single digit margins. If you look yeah. at you know, most three PLs, most transportation companies, you know, low single digit margins. So there's really only one place, you know, it can come from. Um, now I'm sure that one place is going to want to, to share the joy of that with, with everybody else along the along the chain, but the majority of it's got to come out of where where the majority of it is today. So value extraction is, you know, favors the the brand owner. I'll shift and I'll go back to echo a little bit what Sarah said just to give my two cents. But I think it forces technology's hand. I think that the cost has to come from somewhere, and it's not going to be okay to have ten people in logistics to get shipping labels and HTS codes organized. I think it's not going to be okay to have a 10 person quoting team, you know, have to be based in China to develop that if we don't find ways to drive efficiencies in supply chain, which primarily I think is software, I think consumer, I think it will have to come from the OEMs. Consumers will have to pay more. Um, but I don't think enough innovation is being done in the space in supply chain to think about, we need efficiency because a world can exist in the pre COVID, the, the tariff world anymore. I just don't think we'll go back to that, that ecosystem. 
Well, and so I you think Sarah right. efficiencies efficiencies yeah, to be had. Something else on top of what Ron said, um, because I moderated a panel about a month ago on sustainability, mm -hmm. and everybody thinks that the consumer is going to pay more um, if it's a sustainable brand. And actually, I had you know the head of carbon footprint for HP on the panel and another lady, and they were both saying absolutely not. No. Like, yeah. Consumers aren't even going to pay more for sustainability, and um, a lot of people out there that I've that I've been speaking to think that they will and they won't, and so that's another huge uh, concept that we need to be thinking about in supply chains as well, because mm -hmm. we're not only we were at an end to end people end to end supply chain people invest a lot of time a lot of money into that, and now we're shifting towards a circular, so that's also going to shift the supply chain, and that's also going to shift where the costs are going to come from, and that we need to be more efficient from a tech perspective. Consumers are going to expect us to be circular and sustainable, et cetera, et cetera, but they're not going to want to pay more. Yeah, I think there's a bottom line there, isn't it? You know, they won't pay more for it. They're, they're just not going to pay more for sustainability. They're not going to pay more for made in a particular region. So where do you think, Sarah, where do you think the efficiencies can can come from on a on a logistics side? Is it can we take enough can we take sufficient value from that by making making supply chain more efficient, creating more digital transformation, getting away from filling in labels and spreadsheets and all that good stuff? Absolutely. I mean, I think we um, we definitely need to, if, we're, if we weren't taking a look at technology before COVID and we're not taking a look at it now, I'm not sure where you're going to be. I mean, you've really got to be diving into that technology side and filling in those gaps of efficiencies. I mean, you know, what what can we put in as far as process to make things better to make things more efficient, more cost effective, especially on the logistics side. Um, one of the favorite things I like to say on the show is collaboration is the future of business. Collaboration is one of those keys to success moving forward. Technology is one of them, but collaboration is another. Too much are we siloed. You know, marketing is not talking to supply chain. Sales isn't talking to supply chain. Customer experience isn't talking to supply chain. Supply chain is a huge component of the business that drives a lot of factors that has to do with the other business components. And so that's where I see, I see a lot of movement. I mean, you know, technology, huge. Collaboration is another one. Not only just internally and inside your own companies, but also looking outside your companies. I mean, through... Through COVID, I've spoken to a number of different people that are saying they've spoken to, you know, competitors that they yeah. never would have thought that they'd be shaking hands with, that they're shaking hands with in a situation like this, and they're seeing the possibilities. It's huge. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is huge. And, and Sarah is a great example of that. Um, collaboration and connection. I attended one of their happy hours the other the other <laughs> evening with a whole bunch of people and you know, we've already started talking to each other and there are different projects that, that come out of that kind of thing. And I think we're seeing people do that now. Ron, from your point of view, are, are you seeing people's hand being forced in terms of collaboration and digital transformation? Are people asking you that or are they still kind of floundering with everything that's urgent and desperate? I, I think collaboration, collaboration has, has been happening for a long time, but it's it's one of those things that you know, it's not on a scale from zero to a hundred. It, it's something that can continue on and on and, and, mm. and can expand, you know, kind of in perpetuity. So what is the right level of collaboration? I have seen specifically on, you know, PPE and ventilators and, and the number of people have been calling us going, you know, can you help with this? Can you help with that? And, and some of them are, you know, legitimate players looking for help. And some of them are, you know, hobbyists thinking they're going to jump in and save the world by you know, making them in their garage or something. But as part of getting sucked into some of that over the last month or so, I have seen a lot more collaboration and cooperation, you know, up and down the supply chain between between parts of the supply chain that are sometimes adversarial, adversarial over delivery, mm -hmm. adversarial over price. And so, you know, people that have a customer supplier relationship that has always been functional, but there's only been a certain amount of collaboration allowed. So there's there, there's more a little of those groups start to work together now mm -hmm. that previously were more adversarial. Yeah, and I think you know part of it is because you know everybody wants to be part of uh, something that is you know 
the greater good at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. But they're realizing that, you know, letting my supplier know a little bit more about my inner workings is is, is probably not going to, you know, damage my company. And the suppliers are mm-hmm. learning the same, you know, being a little more open about what is our capacity and what drives our, our processing lead times and stuff, right? And so I, I think if we take that forward and, you know, embrace that going forward and realize that the people along supply chain operate different business models and they have different risks, they have different capital costs, they have different expectations. Yeah. And to the extent that we honor those, but then still maximize within that framework, what is the collaboration that can happen? I think we can take a lot of costs out there. You know, the global supply chain is not as efficient as, as you know, a lot of people would like to think that it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Well, let's take this time to go to, we have a couple of customer or, or listener uh, questions that came in. So I'd like to take the first one and, and maybe Sarah, you brought this up, so I'll, I'll, I'll target to you first and then we can go to Ron. How much of a role does the government play in making sustainable products more affordable? Uh, like EVs getting rebates in some states, is there a possibility to see these rebates or subsidies begin to spread to different products? Uh, what, what, what do you think there, Sarah? Um, you know, I'm not a sustainability expert. However, I would say that with what we're going through with COVID right now and the amount of money that's being poured back into the business community, as well as um, obviously giving to, to people um, that aren't working and, and different things like that, I think we might, we might see potentially a step back on that. Um, and the government put it back on the corporations. Um, I mean, I, I, somebody was watching, I think one of the co-founders of the Home Depot the other day, and the guy is 90 years old and he was saying something about the fact that we have been in this for a month. And if companies can't see the light of the tunnel without the help of the government, then we're in big trouble. (laughs) So I think in that statement alone, what he's basically saying is that the companies really need to decide what they're focused on and what needs to change in order for them to succeed in the future. If sustainability is important to them, they need to come up with a way to be able to do that without holding the government responsible. Mm -hmm. You know, the company, companies need to be responsible to themselves and they need to be responsible to their customers as well. And so, you know, I, I kind of, kind of agree with it, but not really. And I think that if we do wait on the government, we'll be waiting for too long. Yeah, what, what, this is my thought. What do you think, Ron? I'm sure you've worked with many companies that have a supply chain strategy to be more supply or more sustainability driven versus not. Do you think the government plays a role there? Yeah, so I'm actually gonna I'm gonna twist your your question a little bit. And so, you know, look, I'm I'm a capitalist pig at heart. Um, I, I've studied economics. I play in the markets a lot, and I believe that capitalism solves the vast majority of things. And I believe that. You know, Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations is the greatest, you know, economic book ever written, you know, and it talks about the invisible hand of the market. Yep. At the same time, unfettered capitalism can be dangerous. And that's why we have rules on monopolies and things like that. I'm getting a little bit long winded here. But if you look at the EV revolution, if you look at the solar revolution, that could not have happened in a market that was purely driven on supply and demand based on price, because fossil fuels have always been so cheap that you could never really get started with some of these things. And so, you know, the government starting incentives have allowed those businesses to get to enough critical mass mass that now they are competitive. And it's very similar to what you're seeing in Japan. Now, Japan wants lower risk in their supply chain and they are now paying companies to get out of China. Then they have to pay those because the invisible hand of the market won't pull them out necessarily, not in everything, right? And so I do think there is a role going forward in in governments playing a role around whether it's sustainability, whether it's around carbon footprint, whether it's around things that are in the national best interest that get obscured because of the pricing pressures in the market. So to the extent that they can shift those pressures in the market to encourage behaviors that are good for the nation, I yep. think you're going to see a lot more of that. And I think you're going to see a bunch of it starting with the U.S. Yeah, it's how does the invisible hand actually help influence whatever those factors are? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's a great approach. I'll also give a plug that 
uh, Earth Day is coming up on the, the 22nd uh, of April here. Uh, one of our former speakers, uh, Scott from Dragon, is actually doing an entire talk on sustainability in manufacturing. So if folks uh, and people who ask this question are interested in learning more, uh, I'd check that out uh, and we can share a link in our in our uh, LinkedIn group on the supply chain bunker yeah. so people can sign up uh, for that. But re re really great. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, no, I was I was interested as we kind of talk about the role of government. And I like the fact that Ron moved the debate on to where we are now with the role of government, because it's really interesting to see what's happening there. And what we're seeing with that Japan thing and what we're seeing in the media a little bit is is a railing against the idea of globalization in terms of the economic model that presents us and the supply and manufacturing model that that presents us. Um, and then the suggestion that manufacturing locally solves a lot of these problems. It's felt a little bit, as I've been observing, that actually globalization has helped solve some of those problems because the manufacturing disruption has been moving like the virus from location to location. And we need to be able to switch manufacturing to the location that's got the available capacity. And, you know, that's one of the things Fictive are very good at. And that's one of the things that you're used to doing for your clients, Ron. How do you see that globalization debate? I mean, is globalization suddenly bad? You know, there, there have been fans and, and, and detractors of globalization forever. Globalization isn't going away. Um, the world is getting flatter. Transportation is getting better. Communications are getting better. Skill sets are getting more dispersed. Demand is getting more dispersed. So globalization is here to stay. How people think about serving regional markets, how people think about and how nations think about access to critical technologies, access to critical uh, defense materials, critical life-sustaining materials, critical food sources, things like that, is going to change. Um, and rather than just you know look at the entire world as you know one big flat uh, playing field for yeah. all things manufacturing and supply related there's going to be some carve outs around that there's going yeah. to be some stuff like japan is doing i think you're going to see probably in the next year and a half i think you will actually see some legislation out of the united states around certain medical equipment not necessarily forbidding yeah. it being built offshore but to make sure that there is a minimum amount of capacity and maybe artificially created demand for yeah. locally built product. You know, it's kind of like the yeah. argument has always been for the U.S. steel industry, right? Okay, we can get steel anywhere, but in a time of war, in a time of you know some type of global stress, yeah. Yeah. isn't isn't having steel within our country something that we probably need? Yeah, it is, and so you know we have artificially supported that, or you know, depending on whether you believe the World Trade Organization or not you know, we've done things to protect that industry. Yeah. yeah, I would encourage people to listen to the webinar that um, was on yesterday and that was specifically about the healthcare um, supply chain, but things like the uh, FDA now requesting uh, more early warning information from people in, in the supply chain that they hadn't requested before, the way they've changed regulations. There's a whole bunch of activities happening um, and as we go through these these now next and future states with um, with COVID-19 and, and the recovery, there's going to be different roles for globalization. Here in Australia, all we're exporting now is lamb. So all our uh, all our all our flights are leaving the country no longer with holiday makers, but there's a there's a rack of lamb on every seat. So it's changing in terms of supply and demand. Dave, I'm going to ask my co-host. But you've seen this movement of, um, of manufacturing as it's happened, and you've got manufacturing partners all over the world. Where do you, where do you see that going? What's your strategy? I was just going to smile because I think Sarah and I would say Canada just exports maple syrup all day. So if you have lamb, you know, we could have or a, ice wine. Or ice, ice wine. I think those are our two things. Uh, ice wine, lamb, and maple syrup. We got the world covered. Uh, yeah. But in, in, all, in all seriousness, yeah, I think it's a – it's a shift, you know, I think Ron is spot on that there are specific products, commodities that need some type of localization and those are critical to how the economy runs and turns over. But I think that our fundamental belief is you need to get better choice around the world. Mm. Is you need to give engineers companies choice 
So they can decide, do I want sustainability? Do I want a low cost option? Do I want a higher yield? Like these are all aspects across our, our classic triangle of speed, quality, price, right? It always comes back to those three. And today, most supply chains are built and operated out of necessity. It's saying, I got to get my product to market and you're just scrapping the thing to go together. I like to say it's, it's a MacGyver approach most of the time. It's bubblegum and shoestring that's actually building products. But if you can build a world based upon globalization with more choice, um, I believe you build more robust supply chains. And this goes into whether you want to build a Toyota city model or whether you want to be globally spread uh, across there that um, I think choice is the most critical factor. I'm obviously a believer in technology, it gives you more access, it democratizes, it, it allows you to, to have uh, better redundancy and this idea of geographic resilience. Um, mm. These are things that I think are critical that, listen, you can look at this century. You don't even have to say, you know, the last five years, but you can look at earthquakes, you can look at tsunamis in Japan, you can look at global trade with tariffs. You can now look at pandemics. These are things that have happened in the last 20 years. And if this isn't enough of a wake up call to say, we need to rethink uh, the strategies here, then I think those businesses will all fail that don't wake up. So uh, it's a great forcing function. You know, with all the bad, I think this is a good, Sarah, Sarah started this off with saying, there's a lot of good things. And I put a big hashtag on my page that the world is not doom and gloom. Uh, there's yeah, yeah. a lot of great things that will come out of this uh, from communications, you know, like we've been talking about to technology to really just, you know, building better products and supply chains and yeah, really looking forward to that. So maybe to, to yeah. end, uh, I started some of it, so I'll steal your thunder, Phil, but we always like to recap at the end of uh, what are some of the key takeaways that, that we have here. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd love, you know, Sarah, what, what would you say? Maybe we can start with you. What, what do you want the, the listeners to take away and take home from this discussion today? Just take a look at the gaps, shine the light into the darkness of, of your supply chains and figure out where they are, um, mitigate those risks, right? Figure out how to mitigate those risks and um, use technology to do it. Cool. Couldn't, couldn't have said it better. And how about you, Ron? What are some good takeaways from your, your side that you, you hope people are paying better attention to and, and thinking about? You know, just in time, highly efficient supply chain works when it works and it can be catastrophic when it locks up. And so I think people need to have a longer term perspective and, mm -hmm. and normalize out the cost trends and normalize out the margin trends and say, you know, it's worth spending a little bit more to put some robustness, to put some redundancy, maybe to put some buffer inventories and address what might come because it's going to come. It's about when, not if. I love that. Yeah, normalize absolutely. it. Not so much spike, but normalize it and and not if, but when. That's great. And how about you, Phil? What, what are, what so, are your ways? Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, I absolutely agree with um, what both Sarah and what, what Ron said. Um, you know, one of the key takeaways for me is people won't pay more. They're not going to pay more for sustainability. They're not going to pay more for stuff not being manufactured in a particular place or it being manufactured elsewhere. I love the phrase just in time being replaced by just in case. I think that's really significant. I think rethinking all those lean principles and saying, hey, which of these lean principles work? You know, just in time is just one of them. I look at all these lean cells that people have built in their factories and everybody is like a foot from each other so they can pass products. So mm -hmm. redesigning that's going to be um, a huge challenge. And more collaboration between companies. Don't depend on the government. Get working together and come up with some of these solutions. More, more press releases with Flex and Jable in the title. That's what I want to see. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I, I think from my end, you know, I'll I'll continue just to push my my position of study history. I think it's important yeah. to to look at trends that have happened in the past and how has that changed our world that we are in today. And so, what are we going to look at going forwards? Um, I'll point people towards the idea of inventory being fundamentally evil, uh, shifting towards how do you actually normalize these costs to, to use Ron's phrase and, and that, you know, maybe, maybe buffer stock isn't such a bad thing. And, and maybe that you are, you do need to think about how you diversify your supply chain. Uh, and probably the last thing and the biggest takeaway for me, and I have to give a big thank you to Sarah 
but there's a lot of good in the world and to have <laughs> gratitude and thanks and just really uh, looking at all the positive things that this is a forcing function for us uh, to really change. And I think uh, part of being in the bunker together is to, to be able to share that. So uh, I can't thank you enough, Sarah, Ron, for, for joining the show. Uh, I've learned an immense amount and I hope everyone listening has too. So just uh, I give you a round of applause from everyone here and, and thank you for joining and uh, hope you have a, a good morning, Phil, uh, yeah. in Australia and a, a good evening to our folks on the, the East Coast. So, thanks, thanks for morning. having me. It was fun. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thank yeah, you, everybody. Thank Stay you. safe. Take care of yourself. We'll right. chat soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.